and we're back. So poor, poor, insensitive Yamogi is uh, getting told off by Maizumi once again. It's better than being oversensitive like you, isn't it? Eh. That aside, do you actually want to be my conversation partner? You must be joking. Why don't you go talk to a snowman? Tossing a scornful word words his way, Lin turned to her bedside. Yamogi plucked his li puckered his lips and blew a smoke ring. And then... Hey, see, G. Can you lend me a hand? Kimi's voice called out from below. Ah, looks like I found someone to pass the time with after all. Mogi stood up with a spring in his step, then descended up into the underground storeroom with a cigarette between his lips. I suddenly remembered as I watched their exchange. Right before I transferred to the shelter cabin last night, when we were putting the newspaper back together, Yamogi, Lin, and Yuni were all freezing. So then what happened here overnight? If anything, three of them seemed to be even more relaxed than after the tra when I transferred this afternoon. They were calm and quiet, as if nothing was wrong. Does being three of them have settled the matter with the newspaper while I was away? However, the cinders of the problem are blown on once again like they are now, then eventually we'll catch fire again. Come to think of it, I had two questions since I arrived here. First is, how could the newspaper from July 2011 exist here? This, it should still be January 20, 12th, 2011, in the shelter cabin. So why is the newspaper here from half a year later? Could it be that, like, my consciousness the new paper jumped through time and space and shown itself half a year early? He thought the same thing I did! However, in, in my case, it's like my consciousness had jumped. In other words, something without a physical form. In contrast, the newspaper had, how can I explain it? Had mass! The newspaper was an entity composed of solid material. Even if it weren't a newspaper, but a CD-ROM or something. If only the information in the article had transferred, then you could say it was the same as my situation in a way. It's not how things were. The page was made out of actual paper. On top of that, it was printed in substance called ink. Therefore, I couldn't imagine how the paper could have been transferred here via the same transference phenomenon. That's why, uh, Then why is the newspaper from the future here? I felt like I couldn't reach a conclusion no matter how hard I thought over it. Continuing on, my second question about Kokoro. Did Kokoro really read this newspaper article? If so, then how she feel about it? Of course, it wasn't just Kokoro. Mogi and Lin read it as well. If someone had, uh, were to find the newspaper from the future in which their own death was described, how would they think? How would they feel? I tried thinking, what if it were me? A newspaper from the future of unknown nature. In that new paper was an article describing my death. If it were me and I read that, what would I think? Hmm. <laughs> I'd believe it insofar as to take advantage of that. But I'd most likely believe what the article said. If it did have future data written on it, I don't think I'd be able to laugh it off so carelessly. If you ask me why, it's because the words of three bodies are those who survived the crash were written there. Among the names were the three people, uh, of those three people were my own, as well as the other two others of the shelter cabin. On top of that, even Uni's name appeared here. That meant that was, they were correct in saying that these four specific people died in a plane crash. Therefore, there are only two possible explanations. Their newspapers from the future were from the past, but written by someone with the abnormal ability of foresight. But no matter which was true, it didn't change the fact the first half of the article was dead on. In that case, it was only human nature to believe the rest of the article would come true as well. Looks like I'm going to die on January 17th. If it was me, that's what I'd think. So Yamogi, Lin, and Kokoro are probably thinking that as well. On the surface, they're doing their best to appear calm, but in their hearts, I'm sure they're all beset by excruciating uneasiness. On top of that, they were stuck inside the shelter cabin tricked by a snowstorm. They had nowhere to run. Despair. In a way, I had nowhere to run either. After all, I might find out I'd died by the, from the time the next transfer came. I understood that feeling so well it hurt. Especially Lin's. Suddenly, feeling worried, I turned to face her. Lin was crouched out in the corner of the bed, staring at the floor. The fire spirit she'd shown until now had disappeared completely. Her, my feet unconsciously steered me in her direction. I slowly drew near and then took a seat in the bed next to Lin. You want something? She spoke softly without even raising her head. No, it's just... Sorry, I'm not really in the mood to talk to anyone right now. Could you leave me alone? I... I can't do that. I can't do that. I spoke quietly, trying not to irritate her. What is it then? Is there something you want to say? Speak kind words. Hey, Lynn. What are you so scared of? Scared? Me? Lynn raised her head. Yeah, that's right. Of the four of us here, the one who's most afraid is probably you, Lynn. Put up a tough front, but that's not what you're really like. Real more you is more timid, more delicate, more fragile, more easily hurt than anyone else. That's why to protect yourself, you build a wall around yourself. Why are you saying that? Because you don't talk like you know everything about me. I can't help it, because I do know everything. Lynn bit her lip and narrowed her eyes. She looked at me dubiously. It's okay, Lynn. You don't have to be scared. 
I'm with you. I'll protect you. I said that with, to her with the intent of comforting her. I was trying to convey my innermost feelings to her. However... What is with you? All of a sudden, Lynn stood up. She'd heard enough. Don't you understand the situation we're in? You could die too, you know. Looking down at me, she spat those words as though she were sick of it all. And despite that, you still try to make fun of me and confuse me. What's wrong with you? I've told you over and over again, but let me say it one more time. Don't you dare pretend to be Sitaru in front of me ever again. Okay? Got it? Having shouted all that at me, she rolled away and stomped off in the other direction. She walked in and over to the corner of the room. She disappeared through the hole leading the underground store and was if trying to avoid me. I could do nothing to stop her. No matter what I said to her now, she would probably be useless, I thought. I could tell she wasn't exactly a sound mind at the moment. At times like these, there's nothing you can do but leave her alone. Get off the bed and let her slide. Left her side. Mogi and Yuni appeared, as though changing places with Lin. The two of them climbed the ladder, one after another. Give me a moment. Sorry about that. Had to turn on the fan. Didn't want you guys hearing all the beeping and stuff. Did something happen? They were. Uh, they say while looking at me in complexion. At my complexion. No, it's nothing. Uh, fading complacency. I got up from bed. The newspaper was lying in the corner of the room. I went over and picked it up. I sat on the log chair near the table. I spread out, patched up newspaper, and scanned the article. I've only read part of this newspaper. There could be other important information hidden somewhere in the rest of the articles. I was worried about Lynn, of course, but I couldn't concentrate on all my efforts on her. Transfers. The transfers started everything. There could be a clue in the paper somewhere that might shed light on them. I resolved, I proceeded to speed read the articles. And then... <laughs> Captain! Captain Yamogi! Come here quickly, I've discovered hidden treasure! What? Hidden treasure, you say? Let's have a look. I heard Yuni Yamogi's voice is behind the paper. Oh, this is quite splendid. Yep. It's seen. Magnificently colored treasure indeed. Moreover, those blue and white stripes are quite unexpected. Halt, Private Uni. Touching is prohibited. It may be booby-trapped. Booby-trapped, you say? Yes, that's correct. Closing up on you with a great snap. You see, a snap. It's a very real possibility. But Captain, such a chance that this might not appear before us give her again. This is a trap. I'll sacrifice myself. You fool. What are you saying? I can't let my precious private first class face such danger. As a captain, I'll take full responsibility. No, the death of the captain means the death of the entire squadron. I have no wife or children, and nobody to cry over me. Silence! To say such a thing, you bastard. Do you intend to keep all the treasure for yourself? But what are you saying, captain? I never so much crossed my mind to do such a... God. <laughs> What the heck are you guys doing back there? That way of speaking. Would you perchance, perchance be you, Kidokun? Seems they finally noticed. It's too much of a pain to answer, so I got straight down to business. So, what are you guys doing, squatting over there like that? Well, it is. Bogey and Unique stared at each other, then reached and turned their gaze to me. With their eyes turned to the place where am I? Now the place where Coco's thighs converged. I instantly understood what they were doing and what their conversation had been about. Ah. 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 I could only sigh. You two are sure laid back. I feel like I might get caught up in the same feeling just by looking at you guys. Even though I might die as soon as the next transfer happens. And even if I did manage to survive that, faced with a mountain of virgin problems that were sure to kill me afterward. Well, it's true that compared to over there, this world here is a lot more peaceful. I always have to be on my toes over there. I don't know who I can trust. Looking at it that way, I do feel a lot more laid back when I'm here. Took off the wristwatch as I complained. As had become my habit, I put it in my pocket. What do you mean by here and there? No, it's nothing. Please continue. Saying that I held up the newspaper once again. Even if you tell us to continue. Yeah. After all, for the time being, you're a girl, Sitaru. Wouldn't it be better if you close your legs? I don't really mind. It's no big deal if someone sees it. Besides, if I do close them, we'll go back to how they were before, so as soon as I let my guard down. 
been a habit for so long, you can't really expect me to change it. But, if Koku asks, please tell her I was really careful. Saying that from behind the newspaper, I heard Uni and Yumogi begin to confer in frantic whispers. I don't really know what they're talking about, but, well, whatever. I forget about them and focus on the newspaper instead. There was an article about Flight 18 on a local news page, but there wasn't any new information on it. It was the same no matter how many times I read it. It's not like the text of the article will change. After a snow thaw, the decomposed corpses three been found in the mountain, lost their lives in an avalanche, so they were survived until that time, and Yu's name was written on the newspaper as well. Sole survivor, Kusuda Unicoon. Half a year after the accident, he has yet stabilized and is steadfast and refused to speak. Professional police still waiting for Yu's condition to improve. Oh, that's right. I forgot something important about Uni. In the shelter cabin right now wasn't the Uni of 2011. Even if he was in that body, the consciousness dwelling inside the body belonged to Uni of 2012. If not, then how could the words of the Uni at Sphia be explained? Uni at Sphia had said he didn't know anything about Makakura. He was definitely involved in plane crash, but when he came to afterward, he was suddenly at Sphia. That's what he said. This Uni and that Uni had, if only once, changed places with each other, like me and Kokoro. I'll go ask the Uni here about it, and... Damn it! That's when the transfer happens. Reflection 2. Make sure of it. Right as I thought that, the scenery shifted. Hot pain in my left arm. I effectively jumped back and stood ready. A silhouette clutching a knife. It might still be nearby, but there was no one there. I restlessly looked around, bobbing my head like a chicken, but there's no trace of anyone else in the room. I'm gonna save. Just because I'm paranoid now, be after that last death. Now this is my room. My room is Sphia. Just be safe, I checked the closet and under the bed and even the bathroom. Not so much as a shadow to be found. I patted down my body and found no other wounds except for the one on the left arm. Ew. I muttered as I wiped sweat from my brow. Somehow it looks like Kokoro managed to get away. A feeling of relief blanketed me. Was it only tension that kept me standing? Fatigue suddenly surged through me. I sat down on the floor, drained of energy. I couldn't so much as take a single step. My body was heavy as stone. I was somehow able to move uh, my right arm far enough to uh, take out a wrist watch. Present time, 8.08 p.m. Since taking time to make sure the room was safe, I estimated a transfer was happening at about 8.06. Put my wrist watch back in my pocket. And then I left, my head rang. Hang, sorry. I gently rubbed my throbbing left arm with my palm on my right. Hmm? Felt odd to the touch. Something appears to be wrapped around my arm. Felt strong pressure on the wound, too. So back up, my rusty joints creaking and groaning as I did. I walked over to the door and locked it just in case, and then returned to the center of the room. Took off my clothes, looked at my left arm. Bandages! White bandages wrapped around it. Part of the cloth was discolored by a thick line of red blood that was oozed from beneath its surface. Tracing the line with my fingertips, it felt numb and tingling. Did Kokoro dress it herself? I doubted she could bandage it so neatly using only her right arm. It wasn't even a dominant arm, after all. So then, one of the other three. As I pondered the question, I decided to put my clothes back on. Gritting my teeth against the pain, I passed my arm through the sleeve. Now then. And before I had time to catch my breath, emotions began to swell within me. An exulting feeling bubbled up from within me. There was, were the, those were the emotions I felt towards Kokoro. Even if I thanked her a thousand times, or ten thousand, or a million, I wouldn't, it wouldn't come close to expressing the depth of my gratitude to her. Because Kokoro was the one who let me escape from the demonic hands of the killer. There was nothing I could do. Even though it was my body, there was nothing I could do to help. Kokoro had saved my life. A deep emotion that couldn't be expressed in mere words expanded within me until I felt like I'd burst forth from my heart. I wanted to hug her and hug her and hug her, muscle her hair and shout in her ears. Thank you, Kokoro. I'm thank so thankful I could sing. That was an unfulfillable wish. Unfulfillable wish. Well, at the very least, I could write it all down, I thought. I sat at the desk at once and picked up the pen. Eh? When I turned my eyes toward the memo pad, I noticed it. Letters I don't remember writing had been scribbled there. Nice to meet you, Yukido-san. I felt dizzy just reading the first line. The letters showed pretty low handwriting skills, like the scribbles of a foreigner trying to learn Japanese by imitating others. Then I remembered. That's right. Kokoro's left-handed. The injury is on her left arm, so... I see, so she couldn't help but write like this. It's inexcusable to complain about poor handwriting and whatnot, someone who just saved her life. Instead, the shoddiness of the letters she'd written beautifully conveyed how heroic Kokoro was. With the utmost effort, trying her hardest, she wrote this. In order to give her earnest gesture the attention it deserved, I set up Ranron straight and went to reading her message. 
Nice to meet you. I wonder what I should write. There's so many things I wanted to write. So you can bring it all together very well. You'll probably tell us to look at my handwriting is like this too. It might be difficult to read, so please forgive me. First off, certain important things to you. Read all the messages you left me in the notepad. So I'm able to listen to half your message in the voice recorder left to Shelter Cabin. I'm able to listen up to see if someone's after me. About your left arm. The one who cut you, your left arm, that someone was the one who did it. That person tried to take away my, your life. In other words, that's how it is, right? But so who's that someone? Please explain in a little more detail. What's happening in Sitara's body? Why is it you believe someone's after you? Or then, did you say that Shelter Cabin's voice recorded too? I was able to hear part of it, so I don't know. If by chance you didn't record it there, please reply here. But the culprit. The truth is, it's not as if I don't have any ideas. There's no reason to beat around the bush, so I'll just go ahead and write it. So this is guy Hattori. Hattori John. You're aware she has the ID, right? Recently she's been fixed in her Hattori personality, though. Though, however, I don't think it'd be unusual for a hidden personality to awaken at any time. By her hidden personality, I mean the other personality within her. The personality that killed 12 people in Aizumi Hospital. It would be possible that the personality is targeting you, Sidaru. Say that's not decisive evidence. I know this is all stuff we've read before, but I'm trying to remind myself of where we are in her story. Careful just in case. Next about uni. It's extremely complicated, so I can't say it very well. What should I do? That's right. First, I need something to ask you. Have you ever met a young boy named Kusa Uni? You know, right? The thing is, maybe Uni is teleporting. They're finally communicating in more detail. An earthquake occurred at Svia because that breaker was tripped. Blackout occurred. It's fixed now, though. Time to transfer. Occurred person. I'm still here. Please try not to die. Uh, this is all normal. So then this is where Kokoron will end her message. Kindly forgive Ruffson's writing. Do anything weird in my body, I'll never forgive you. You saw it too, right? Newspaper in a shelter cabin? I guess she transferred mid-sentence. After the line, newspaper is in the shelter cabin. The rest of the page is blank. She didn't draw, uh, draw anything this time either. I was kind of hoping she would, so I actually felt a little disappointed. That aside, I should write her a reply before it's too late. Grab the pen and force, face the white notepad. He goes into that that stupid semi-poetic I'm so thankful that you saved my life thing. And after writing this, I realized something. That's right, that's it! Kokoro should know about that time! Kokoro had seen the killer. No, wait. The message, what do you mean by somebody? As though she hadn't the slightest idea. In other words, she didn't see the culprit after all? Everything took place while she was asleep after taking the pill. Is that it? At any rate, I've got to ask her. I once again turned to Notepad. You know who the culprit is? Please tell me in detail about what it, it is, what, what it was that happened then. I'm begging you. Alright, this is all repeat. Come on. I don't suppose tab works. Nope. Later. I finished writing the message and decided to go to the dining area for dinner. I was incredibly hungry. Because I hadn't eaten anything since this morning. In the end, I didn't even get that neither breakfast nor lunch that Yitsumi made. Which reminds me, I wonder what happened. I was away from Ko Svia. Uh, did Kokoro eat it for me? At any rate, it didn't change the fact that I was hungry. Crucifies rat. Alright. We'll see how much longer I can keep going. My throat is definitely bothering me a bit, but we'll keep going. Entering the dining area, I saw Hattori and Nini sitting in their usual places. On the table was a pot of beef stew with pure white steam flowing from it. 
Additionally, there was salad bread, glasses of water, and tableware of cutlery. Ah, perfect timing for you, Kawasan. I was just about to come and call you. Sumi said that the moment she saw me. Though disappointed, I calmly corrected her. You could have sit her now. Oh, I'm sorry. Yutsumi replied curtly, urging me to sit. I do this every single time. I seriously started considering putting a name tag or something whenever I left the room. With the four of us assembled at the table, big dinner began. As their spoons traveled back and forth from out to plate, Utsumi, Hattori, and Nini used an interval between mouthfuls to chat. It was neither noisy nor quiet. A supremely ordinary meal time. None of the topics of conversation stood out in particular. The main subject was the earthquake that had occurred at Sia. Since Kokoro had written about her message, I wasn't too surprised. I made the appropriate murmurs of agreement from time to time, along with the occasional forced smile, and this was able to ignore the conversation pretty well. I had only one thing on my mind. The killer who slashed my left arm. It could very well be the case the culprit is here among the three of them. Kept a close eye on the events going on around me as I ate, but nobody did anything suspicious. Which means the real culprit is someone else, lurking someplace unknown to us. I kept eating as I considered all those possibilities, and I don't remember I don't actually remember how the meal tasted. Still my hunger was out of control and I consumed the beef stew in a flash. By the way, from listening to the conversation to pick up one thing. Pierce Hitori is the one who treated my arm. I was a little surprised. So Hitori had a gentle side like that after all. Before returning to my room, I tentatively decided to express my gratitude to her. Thanks, Hattori. And in reply, she said, No need to thank me. It wasn't anything special. On her turning to uh -huh. <laughs> Hold on! So either she's pretending to know what he's talking about, or she's not doing a personality exchange and just knows exactly when to be mute. That doesn't sound right. No, that's super weird. She could just be teasing us again. Mm. When returning to my room, I started. I seated myself at the desk and reread the message to Kokoro for one more time. There's only one part of it that troubled me. Because if it isn't so, I can't explain how Yuniku exists in two places at the same time. Same time? Kokoro wrote at the same time. Mina's statement was plain to see. She probably still didn't know that it's 2012 in Sphia. She had an impression that Sphia too exists in the year 2011, like Shelter Cabin. I hesitated. Should I reveal the truth to her or not? After going back and forth, I finally decided. I have no choice but to hide it from her. Because if I don't, she'll find out that I'm from the year 2012. And if she does, I'm sure there'll be all kinds of questions. What happened on Mount Kakura on Jan January 17, 2011? When the question comes up, how should I answer it? According to historical record, you're going to die in five days. I can't say such a thing to her. And that's why I decided to hide the problem from her. As well as the matter of the newspaper. Kokoro was just about to touch on the subject in her message, but I didn't comment on it. I didn't know how I should answer her. In the same case with in the same with the uni case. She seems to be questioning why two unis can exist at the same time. In order to explain it, no matter what, I'd have to reveal to her that it's Sphia, it's the year 2012. If possible, I wanted her to keep an optimistic perspective on the situation. I didn't want her to know about the avalanche on the 17th. I can't saddle her with that, I get another burner. If it's a matter of changing history, my own strength alone should be enough. That's what I, uh, that was what I decided. Casually, I glance at the window and powdery dance, snow dancing outside. The blizzard stopped some time before. The incessant howling of the wind had gone, and as though secretly snatched away. Having rested for a little while, I decided to leave the room. My goal, of course, was to search for the culprit. Is this what you call a proper investigation? It's not as though I, was, I wasn't scared of the killer, but what would wasting time in my room accomplish? I need to find out as much as I could. I opened the door and walked in the dining area. Before I could even think about whose room to start my search in, I figured the lone girl entered my field, the field of vision. Hattori, what are you doing over there? She was standing stock still near the table. An ashen shadow enveloped her. I felt as if I were viewing a faded old, old photograph. Hey, what's wrong? I slowly drew closer to her. She didn't answer. Her head hung low. She was staring fixedly at the floor. Beside her feet lay a dark brown lump, dirtied all over. She was making weird twitching, squirming movements. What's this? I bent closer to take a good look at the uh, at thing on the floor. A rat? It's a rat. I could tell at a glance it was on the verge of death. Its limbs were going to gruesome convulsions. Its eyes so hollowed they could have rotted away. Its mouth flapped open and shut in desperate attempt to breathe. Why here? I stood up and looked at her. Her face was dull and expressionless, hardly like a flesh and blood human. 
Her eyes had no warmth. Her skin had been parched and lifeless sculpture carved from hard sand. It seems as if, there was, uh, if so much as touch her, her whole body would crack and crumble apart. At my feet, a rat on the verge of death, and beside a girl whose soul had vacated her body. Completely bewildered, bewildered though I was, I... Anyway, we have to help it. Murmured that. Help? Vittori suddenly spoke. Yeah, that's right. It's gonna die if we just leave it like that. I had no doubt idea what she was thinking, but just then, without warning, Atori grabbed the rat by its tail. It was all her strength smashed against the corner of the table. Yee! My heart stopped. Though I tried to say something, anything, I couldn't even breathe. It died. She muttered those two words, dangling the dead rat like a pendulum in her hand. Then, with no more care than you show an old rag, she carefully tossed, casually tossed the body away. Jeez. Her face wrapped in an expression of, warped in an expression of boredom. You, what have you done? Those words escaped my trembling throat, my voice hoarse. Tori looked away from me, her lips forming a pout, an expression of complete unconcern. She was calm, as though nothing had happened. The rat now lay dead in the corner of the room, blood issuing from its mouth. It wasn't even convulsing anymore. The thing lying in the corner was no longer a living being. It had been reduced to a mere object. Just a rat. For some reason, I felt very sad. The corpse of a rat lying miserably in the corner seemed so pitiful to me. Kagome, Kagome. Even with my non, yada yada, who's that behind you? And then that's the swamp. No, the song is not the trigger for the swap. We've heard the song plenty of times before and it didn't trigger the swap. <laughs> Why did Hattori suddenly uh, begin to sing the uh, Kagome song? Was it supposed to be some sort of requiem? I just couldn't understand her actions at all. So even after the transfer, the echo in her, her voice still resounded in my mind. Couldn't get it out of my head. A gruesome scene that unfolded before my eyes. I'm in a shelter cabin now. I know that, but Hattori's cruel expression was still scorching my mind. Even now, it rises like a phantom before me. Somehow holding it together, I sat down in a nearby log chair. The imagery of the shelter cabin. Hardly taken what was going on around me. Mogi and Lin stood frozen in place in the middle of the room. Yuni was crouching beside the stove. The air in the room was growing heavy. It was as though some ominous entity was filling the room with a stagnating presence. What's wrong? I asked, but nobody so much as tried to answer. Still wearing a grave expression, Yumogi slowly turned to face me. Yukinoku? Uh, yeah. Did something happen? No, nothing. Don't worry about it. And with that, none of them spoke so much as another word before bed. It seems as if blizzard outside was all ceased at some point. And then that silence, night had fallen. Wrapping myself in blankets in the bed, I took off the wristwatch. January 13th, the third day. It's been a while since I've seen a blue sky. Just like the people of old who worship the sun as a god, I truly felt like thinking it from the depths of my heart, from its downpour sunlight. Yesterday I spent the entire day without taking a single step outside. Perhaps that's why the air was so delicious to me now. Breathing a lungful of fresh air, the coolness of it permeated my entire body. The inner parts of my nasal cavities began to sting, but it was refreshing and it felt good. Last night, the night, last night of a year ago that is, I'd gone to bed in the shelter cabin in Mount Akakura. When I woke up, I'd returned to Sphia. That's why I didn't know exactly when the snowy clouds had been stripped away from the sky above Aosugi Island. Regardless, the snowstorm that had lasted over two days now completely disappeared. Time was around 9 a.m., walking in a large garden south of the main building. It's, I say walking, but even taking so much a single step was no easy task. Fresh snowfall was deep enough to bury my feet. The surface of snow was frozen over like a glaze on a pastry. The feet punch, uh, punched in holes in the icy upper layer and made rustling no sounds as they tamped down the powder underneath. Resistance from the snow put extra strength on my lower body, but even so, walking itself wasn't that hard. It was hard as the snow to jump and frolic around it in a freshing wind. A landscape of untrodden verdant snow spread out before me. The urge to disturb the untouched land was tickling my private, primitive instincts. I felt a little childish, but I was hopping around like an innocent puppy as I cut through this field, this field of white. <laughs> <sighs> I ran out of breath and leaned against a nearby wall. A massive circular wall that enclosed Svea. 
known as the, the wall was here, of course, but looking up at it again it, like this, it really did feel huge as it loomed high over me. A height not even a world record pole vulture could clear. Hmm. It's clear to me trying to jump over it was futile, so I tried climbing up the side of it instead. But it was an unforgiving wall, devoid of hand or foot, uh, footholds, and impossible to climb. For Just for the heck of it, I tried kicking it with all my might. There was a muffled sound of my foot striking in concrete, but that was all. Of course, there isn't so much of the slightest tremor of the wall. As if declaring myself very symbol of immobility and steadfastness, the massive wall stood with silent dignity before me. I headed back the way I came. Sophia's main building was in the distance. Snow covering it shone a bright white. Instinctively, I want to save. Looking at it from the outside, it looked like a castle made of ice from this old myth or fairy tale. The central clock tower soared high in the sky like a tower holding a captured princess. Oh hey, we finally have like a map of the place! While walking under the blue sky, I thought about how Sophia might look from above. First of all, it was round. The center of the building was a clock tower where the radius of about 100 meters from the concrete wall that circled it. The entire area enclosed in the circle was Sphia in its truest sense. Sphia was just a building standing in the middle. When, uh, well then, if there were a radius of 100 meters, so this is an estimate, and the overall circumference of the wall would be... That was 628 meters, huh? Which meant the area of the entire site was... Around 3.14 hectares, I guess. Even with grade school arithmetic like this, I was able to understand the approximate scale of Sphia. 3.14 hectares. If you convert it, it'd be about 7.76 acres. This valley corresponded to about two-thirds of space enclosed by the Paradise Park Dome. Well, it wasn't like anything could be solved with just figured out number. There was something about a bit of a bad habit of mine. Oh, stupid. I just stopped using my head for something this pointless. I shook my head, surprised at myself. There's no point in finding out what numbers are. It didn't feel like they important later on or anything. I stopped, looked up in the sky, and let the abundant sunlight wash over me. Refreshing feeling couldn't be put into numbers. I went back uh, to find that the other three had already finished breakfast. While I'd been walking outside, it sadly appeared they missed. A, I missed a meal. Well, missing one meal shouldn't be too much of a problem. I didn't feel all that hungry. So anyway, the weather is nice. I think we should go outside and get some exercise. Any objections? Oh wow. Okay. That's a bad sign. Doing Uni's voice actually physically hurt my throat. So, I think that is a good time to end today's stream. Huh. And I haven't changed this graphic yet. I'm sorry about that, folks. My name is Lamar Haven. I stream Monday through Friday starting at 10 a.m. PST. That is 1 p.m. Eastern. Tuesday, Thursdays, I stream what you've seen here. Remember 11, Age of Infinity. Blind. We're getting some good information, but I'm kind of just enjoying the journey. Also, I dig the, ex the different clothes that they're finally giving them in Chapter 2 for no reason. <laughs> anyway, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I stream Illusion of Gaia Blind, as chosen by you, the viewers. I'm excited to continue that because I had a lot of fun with that yesterday, and I intend to keep having fun. I interesting translation and all. Ah, alright, but remember 11 gets crossposed to YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, the Unifone link on screen, a link on the stream because my YouTube channel. On YouTube, I have a YouTube specific series, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that is Resident Evil 4. Join Chris and Sheva as they search Africa for the source of the BOWs. Not much to say because I'm so far ahead of the recordings right now, I do have a ton of editing to do. It's because I don't have tomorrow's episode edited and finished yet, but I need to do that and I can get to that soon. That said, I'm starving for lunch and my throat is killing me so I need to go so thank you very much for watching I'll see you folks next time